copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 238 regarding a murder. No description of a suspect in this case. That's all, Rose and Cliff. Remember the time Aunt Aggie and her five children dropped in on you unexpectedly and you had to sleep on the floor? And how stiff and achy you were in every joint the next morning? Friends, that's exactly how your motor feels and acts when you consign it to the park bench, so to speak, with only the threadbare covering of inferior oil instead of giving it the cushioning protection of real loop. You expect your car to give you many thousands of miles of faithful service, don't you? Very well, treat it accordingly. Give it life-prolonging comfort and ease of operation by changing its staff of life to Real Lube, the enduring motor oil that really protects every vital moving part with a satin smooth covering. Smooth, yes, and at the same time so strong and impenetrable that the devastating heat of high speeds and hot weather cannot reach your motor to get in their dirty work. So when you get Rio Grande cracked, the gasoline that powers more police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment, wherever it is sold than any other brand, get Rio Lube, the finest motor oil sold in the West. The story we are to hear tonight was taken in the main from facts on file in the Los Angeles Police Department. We have therefore asked Chief of Police James E. Davis to preface our program. Chief Davis. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sometimes the most dramatic work on the part of the peace officer goes unnoticed by the rank and file of a city's people simply because that work has not been blazoned in headlines. Sometimes an important case is broken, but the story behind it never breaks, for the average peace officer does not want publicity. He does not need it. He does his duty as he sees it and does not look for praise. The vast majority of criminal cases are investigated and closed without fanfare, such as our story tonight, because persons still living might be hurt by the broadcast of certain facts surrounding our story. We have purposely changed both locale and personnel. It is our desire to present our programs without harm to anyone, but to bring out most certainly that crime of any sort is an unprofitable enterprise. I shall reserve additional facts for the end of the program. In a spacious home in one of Los Angeles' most exclusive residential districts, a father and his son engage in heated argument. What do I care about your plans? What way did you to make plans for me? Son, you're not thinking. You're just standing there shouting. And that isn't going to get you anywhere. I am thinking. That's all I've been doing, day and night, is thinking, thinking. If that were the case, you wouldn't be talking like an idiot. Am I an idiot because I've fallen in love? You did the same thing. You laughed at the opposition and resentment. You went right ahead and married Mother, in spite of everything. I'm not offering any opposition. I'm not holding any resentment. You can marry anyone you please, and good luck to you, but not now. Yeah, well, we'll see about that. Why should I obey you when you refuse to give me a logical reason? We won't go into that again. My reason for demanding a delay is sufficiently logical to satisfy me. That's a big help, isn't it? I'll run over and see Mary now and tell her you have a logical reason why we shouldn't get married. She'll probably appreciate that. She'll doubtless have great respect for her future husband. I'll go out somewhere and cool off. And come back and talk to me like a sensible person. It's my uh, turn to stand on my own feet. I can see where it's going to be necessary for me to take whatever action I consider advisable. What do you mean? Uh, you'll find out. And all your money won't do you any good. I'm going to get what I want in this case. Understand that? No matter how I get it. <laughs> Uh, hello, Ted. Yes? Uh, this is uh, Jim Ritter. Oh, how are you, Jim? <laughs> Terrible. I've, uh, I've guessed wrong, Ted. What do you mean? I sold 50,000 shares of consolidated pipe short. Wow, it jumped four points today. It didn't go up until about two minutes before the market closed, so I have until Monday morning to cover. Uh, Ted, can you dig up 200,000 over the weekend? Not a chance in the world, Jim. Oh, I thought perhaps you... Oh, you know I'd do it if I could, Jim, but I'd sold up. How about Westcott? Well, he'd give it to me, I suppose, but... What? Oh, never mind, Ted. Well, thanks all the same. Sorry I can't help you, Jim. Oh, that's all right. 
Bye. I'm sorry, Mary. I can't see you tonight. No, no, it's nothing serious. I... I have something to do. I'll call you as soon as it's done. Goodbye, Della. I'll show him. Hayden, what are you doing in here? Begging your pardon, sir. You told me to bring you some coffee. That's right, I did. Well, after this, knock when you want to come in my room. Uh, yes, Mr. Westcott. I have enough trouble without the servants spying on me. Put the coffee down and get out of here. Yes, sir. Yes. Hayden! Yes, sir. Hayden! Hey, yes, sir. Coming, sir. Where's my son? What? Well, I... That is a... Well, come, come out of it. Why are you stammering? Well, I don't think I should say, sir. Say what? What's the matter with you? Well, uh, Mr. Westcott, Master Carl is in a very bad humor, sir. So am I. Get him. Tell him I want to see him at once. Yes, sir. Oh, shall I wait until you finish writing that letter, sir? No, you heard me. Tell him to come here at once. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The brat. Hello? Hello, Ralph. Yeah. Ted Law. Yeah? It worked. Ritter called me earlier in the evening and wanted to borrow 200000 I referred it to you. Nice work. Did he tell you why he wanted the money? Yes. He said he sold consolidated pipe, sure. <laughs> See me, Monty Ted. I'll make it worth your while. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye. Did you want to see me? Yes, I'm tired of this sulking and I want to stop it. I won't have you telling your troubles to my servants. I haven't been telling my troubles to your servants. Aiden and you have been cooking up something. He acts like a scared rabbit every time I mention your name. I wouldn't put up with this nonsense in my business, and I'd be hanged if I'd put up with it in my home. Is that all you have to say? No. I'm also tired of your impudence, because I won't let you marry the first petticoat you set your eyes on. Dad, you can't say that to me. I know what's best for you, and I'm going to... How would you like to hear a few things I'm going to do? The only thing I want from you is silence. Well, you're going to get more than that before this thing's over. Are you insolent, Papa? Well, Hayden, what in blazes do you want? Uh, Begging your pardon, sir. Mr. Ritter is here. He says it's very important. Oh, Ritter, eh? Then I'll see him. You may go, Carl. I'll finish this later. Mm, business first, of course. Yes. Well, I'm warning you, Dad. Later may be much too late. Go on, get out. Threats are useless weapons. Yeah, well, you'll find out. Now, hi, Carl. Yeah. Good evening, Westcott. What's on your mind, Ritter? I'll come to the point very briefly. Because either you will or you won't. Either I will or I won't what? Either you will or will not lend me $200,000. <laughs> Any good reason why I should? Well, yes, in a way. You dropped a hint that Consolidated Pipe was due for a drop. I followed your suggestion and sold 50,000 shares short. By now, you know the fix I'm in. Why do you sell short when you have the money to cover? I, do, I don't want advice. I want money. Do I get it? Uh, will you pardon me a moment until I finish this letter? Of course. What uh, security have you to offer? My word. <laughs> well, there. Uh, I guess that'll take care of that. There is a favor you could do for me, Ritter. And in return, I might be persuaded to lend you the money. I know exactly what the favor is. Yeah. And I won't do it. On the other hand, I can do you a favor. By forgetting to mention a few things you wouldn't want anyone to hear. I knew you'd try that sooner or later. Well, I've got you where I want you, Mr. Ritter. Yeah, that's what you think. Your best bet is to take a boat to China or jump in the river. Why, you dirty crook. What? You... What is it? What's the matter? Who asked you to come in here? Get out. Yeah, but I heard you quarrel. I can take care of myself. Get out of here. Beg pardon, sir. Did you ring? Yes, mail this letter at once. We're in blazes of the stamps. Oh, here. And hurry. Uh, yes, sir. I'll go, too, if you don't mind. You can keep your money, Westcott. For all the good it'll ever do you. Now, see here, Mr. Ritter. Carl, I believe I told you to leave. I'm not through with Mr. Ritter. I think that before we get through, before we... The oh, Westcott. What's the matter? So the... Uh, Ritter... Oh, catch him. He's uh, I've got him. I call Hayden. Get some water. Uh, Hayden. Hayden! Something's happened to Dad. Oh, gosh, she's passed out. Call the doctor, Mr. Ritter. I'll get the water myself. Never mind the water, Carl. But never mind the water. You mean... Yes. He's dead. Further investigation showed that Westcott's death was due to cyanide poisoning, but how the deadly drug was administered or by whom was still a mystery. Captain Wallace of the homicide detail assigned Lieutenant Sanderson and Ryan to investigate. There's something wrong in this Westcott case, Andy. Something we've overlooked. I don't doubt that, but I haven't any idea what it might be. I noticed that the papers this morning fell back on the old heart failure gag. That's fine. As long as they talk that way, we'll have time to work. 
It's when they start yelling murder without anything to go on that I get worried. Well, I still can't see how a man can die from cyanide poisoning unless he took it himself or somebody gave it to him. Yeah, that's sound as far as it goes, Ryan. But obviously he did take it. According to the stories we've gotten so far, there were four men in that room. None of them admit touching anything. None of them saw anything eaten or drunk. Yet suddenly one of them topples over dead from cyanide. Hmm, could have been suicide. I don't think so. Evidently, Westcott was telling them all where they could go to. He seemed entirely in command of the situation. No, I think he would be the last one of the group to have reason for suicide. Well, then it's a cinch we've overlooked something important. In the meantime, the guy that dishes out and I in all doses is still loose. That's right. I want you boys to go over that Westcott place from cellar to attic and bring Westcott's butler, young Westcott, and that Ritter bird back here. <laughs> particular reason for going in the back way, Sandy? No, none except Tommy Devlin's line and wait for us at the front door. Uh, Newshawk Devlin, right on the job, eh? Yeah. Very good, Sanderson. Trying to put one over on the press, are you? Lying in wait, did you say, so? Oh, hiya, Ryan. What are you boys doing on a suicide case? Yeah, you see, Ryan, I told you we'd get into an argument before this was over. Oh, stop kidding, Sandy. What's the idea? So this looks like a suicide to you, does it, Tommy? Yep. What's the matter with the stories your paper's been running? It was about heart failure. Or don't you read the papers? Nope, I write them. What did you say if I told you I think this is a murder case? I'd say you're nuts. See, Sandy? You can't win. Yeah. Look, Sandy, let's get together. That innocent taxi down the street full of the DA's men, a couple of private detective agencies are staking out the place across the street. I wouldn't be surprised even to see the sheriff's office crowd blow in here any minute. Now, what's coming off around here? Well, Tommy, from where I sit, this looks like a perfect crime. You call it a suicide. It's neither one. There's no such thing as a perfect crime, and Westcott didn't kill himself. Now, let's get inside before we have to argue with some cop and try to identify ourselves. Well, wait a minute. How do you happen to know about this car from the servants' quarters? We've seen blueprints of the house. If I'm not mistaken, this door ought to lead us into the kitchen. Ah, oh, good guessing, Sandy. Let's eat. Anybody that eats or drinks in this house is really nuts. I still don't get your reason for coming in the back way, Sandy. Yeah. Well, in the first place, I thought we'd dodge you. Oh, thanks, pal. Yeah, and in the second place, I didn't want our friends in the taxi to see us come in. And in the third place, I just assumed those babies across the street didn't see us. Besides that, I don't want the officer on the door to know we're here for a while yet. How'd you happen to be uh, around in back here, Devlin? Who, 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 me? Yes, you. Well, I was just trying to find out why Westcott committed suicide. Look, Tommy. You remember that time Charlie Stelmack shot himself and you insisted it was murder? Why don't you give up? This is murder. Let's see you prove it. Quiet. The library's just across the hall. That's where Westcott died, isn't it? Yeah. Wait a minute. I thought I heard someone in that room. Throw your flashlight in there. Yeah, it seems empty. I guess I was wrong. Now then, let's see. Westcott was here by the desk writing. Ritter must have been about there on the sofa. The butler probably came from the same direction we did. The son said he was upstairs. Sandy, look here. What is it? See that little piece of white paper on the blotter there? Mm-hmm. Just about the size of a pinhead. Yeah, if that's what I think it is, we've got the answer to one of our questions. Sandy, Ryan, come in. What's on your mind, Tommy? Take a look at that wall safe. Open. Oh, why in thunder didn't we look for that when we came in? You're not going to tell me there's a safe cracker in the house, too. Well, the safe didn't open itself, and it was closed this morning. I saw it. It looks like whoever opened it did it recently, then. The safe looks full. Let's close it again. I got a hunch we frightened somebody away from that job. Come on, let's get upstairs and find somebody who hasn't had time to get to sleep. I hear somebody coming. Switch off that light. We don't want to tip our hands just yet. Is someone in here? Hayden, is that you? Funny. Must be hearing things. Huh. Young Westcott. So I heard. This is getting complicated. I think we ought to come out in the open. No, I've got a better plan. I've got to get upstairs and look for something. Sign out, I suppose. Exactly. Where do you expect to find it? Stick around, reporter. You'll find out. You know, Westcott's actions just now may have been a bluff. He's had time to dispose of anything he might have taken from the safe. Yes, assuming he's the one who opened it. Well, why don't you get Gaskell out here and get the fingerprints off that safe? Mr. Devlin, at times you amaze me. There's probably a couple of dozen prints on that safe, and you expect to find the murderer by checking. Oh, only a suggestion. 
seems to be a convention here tonight. I wonder who that is. Well, let's go over by the door and see. I'm James Ritter. I got a phone call that I was wanted here. Ritter? Who sent for you? I, uh, I don't know exactly. You see, my valet took the call. But he said Mr. Westcott. Young Mr. Westcott called. Well, you wait here in the library. I'll find out about this. Quick, duck into this room here. It's the music room. I want to listen to this. This is beginning the smack of a 10, 20, 30 melodrama. Oh, uh, Mr. Westcott. Well? Will you come down here a minute? Into the library. Mm, sure, just a minute. Aiden, Aiden, come in here a minute. Now, Mr. Ritter, go right in. Looks like Joe's getting suspicious. Yeah. Hope he doesn't lose his temper and run the whole bunch in. What are we going to do? You stay here, both of you, and find out what happens here. I'm going upstairs by the back way. Gosh, I've just been waiting for something like this. Okay, but make it snappy. Now, Mr. Westcott, what was the idea of sending for Mr. Ritter? I didn't send for him. I didn't phone anybody. Mm, how about you, Hayden? Well, I haven't the faintest idea who could have called Mr. Ritter. Mm. Are you sure you did get a call, Ritter? <laughs> Why, of course I'm sure. You don't think I'd come over here in the middle of the night just for a ride, do you? Well, I don't know. You might at best. Just what do you mean by that remark? Well, never mind. I have a good notion to run the whole bunch of you in right now. Yes? For what? Don't worry. I can find something. That won't be necessary, Joe. I'll just take young Mr. Westcott along with me, if you don't mind. Hey, Sandy, what are you doing here? Come on out, Ryan. I've got a few questions I want to ask the young man privately. What's this all about? I haven't done anything. Joe, take these other two outside, will you? Sure. Come on, you two. Outside. What do you want to talk to me about? Now, take it easy, son. I'm Lieutenant Sanderson, Police Department. This is Lieutenant Ryan. And uh, this bird's a reporter, but he's harmless. I'll sue you for libel, Sandy. Come on, cut out the funny stuff and get to the point. What is this? Mr. Westcott, I might as well tell you that you're suspected of murdering your father. <laughs> Are you crazy? Maybe. Why should I want to kill my own father? That's what we want to know. Was Ritter in on this? I don't even know what you're talking about. You quarreled with him, didn't you? Sure, but what fellow doesn't growl with his father sometime or other? And do they also threaten to kill their fathers, too? That's a lie. I never threatened to kill him. We have statements that say you did. What's the combination of your father's safe? I don't know. You didn't just whistle, and that safe opened up. Why, you... Uh... Take it easy, son. Uh, that'll just give you something else to explain. Tell me, how'd you get that safe open? I'm not talking anymore. Go ahead. Do whatever you want to. You'll beat me up, like you cops always do. I'm not talking. Uh, want me to do it, Sandy? No. Now, uh, look here, son. You've been seeing too many gangster pictures or reading reporters' yarns about the police. We're not going to beat you up or do anything else to you. We just want the truth. Well, you've got all you're going to get out of me. How'd this bottle of cyanide get into your room? What? You heard me. I don't know anything about it. I never saw it before. No, of course not. How'd it get there? I don't know. I won't tell you a thing. Okay, son. Come along. Maybe a few days in a cell will change your mind. <laughs> Where's Ryan? He's in room 47, talking to Ritter. Let's go down there. Are you going to tell me that Ritter killed old man Westcott? Maybe. Who knows? Well, if you ask me, I don't think you do. Hello, Sandy. Now, what have you found out? Nothing. I'm waiting for you. Hi, Mr. Ritter. Very well, thanks. What's the reason for bringing me down here, Lieutenant? I thought this matter was settled. Well, Mr. Ritter, sometimes these things take a little longer to close than we expect. There are a few things that need explaining. Such as? Such as you're needing $200,000 Saturday night and you're going to Mr. Westcott's house to borrow that amount. <laughs> well, you can hardly call that a discovery, Lieutenant. Yeah, that's true. But we found out also that you met your obligation Monday morning. That's true, too. I made a payment in full. Where did you get that much money? I'm not at liberty to say. I presume that you're aware that $200,000 disappeared from Mr. Westcott's safe between the time he died Saturday night and the time you paid your debt Monday morning. Certainly, I knew that. But I understood you had already arrested young Westcott for that. Who told you that? Uh, why, why, I'm not sure. Anyway, how many men are you going to accuse of that crime? As many as seem implicated in it. We can't find the money. Young Westcott says he didn't take it. The natural inference is that you two are working together, that he took the money and gave it to you. I say now, that's a possibility, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That's why we ask you to come down and talk it over. And very nice of you, Lieutenant. Uh, but have you given any thought to the question of why there were $200,000 in a comparatively unprotected safe? Yeah, I imagine that was Mr. Westcott's business. That's correct. It was there because he knew I'd be there and try and borrow it. He knew you were coming to borrow the money? That's right. He intended to lend it to me on certain conditions. So you would see it wasn't necessary for me to steal it. Did you threaten to kill him? If I didn't, I meant to. 
Well, Ritter, it's a good story, but we'll have to hold you. And that's all? On what charge? As an accomplice in the murder of Westcott. And while you're talking your way out of things, think up a good one about why you bought a large quantity of cyanide and what you intended doing with it. With two logical suspects in custody, police still did not feel entirely sure that the murderer of Westcott had been apprehended. Certain that a crime had been committed, Sanderson and Ryan returned to the Westcott home, taking with them the dead man's son. Now, Carl, I want you to show me again just where you were standing when your father fell. Uh, I was over there, just inside the door. And you got across here to this desk before he collapsed? Well, not quite. You see, Mr. Ritter was closer to Dad than I was, and he caught him as he fell. And uh, who else was here? Why, nobody. Oh, that is, nobody but Hayden. He'd just come in from the rear hallway. What was your father doing when he first showed signs of this, uh, this attack? Well, he just finished writing a letter. He sealed it and gave it to Hayden to mail. Was Hayden here when you came in, or did he come in later? Why, I, uh, I believe he came in later. Hey, yeah, I remember he asked Dad if he'd rung. And yeah, then the letter was all ready to go when Hayden came in, huh? Mm, I think so. Yes, I remember Dad couldn't find a stamp at first, and then he found one right there on the blotter. It... Well, say, somebody's cut a piece of that blotter off. We did. Why? What'd you do that for? We had our reasons. Now let's get back to that night. Whose job is it to keep this desk in order? Uh, fill the inkwells, get paper, pens, and so forth. Why, uh, Hayden always tends to that. He has a special fund he uses to buy supplies with. Uh, stamps and things like that. Oh. He buys stamps, does he? Yeah, sure. Paper and pens and all the things like that. Don't know when he happened to buy supplies last, do you, Carl? No, but uh, you'll find a book in his room where he keeps all his accounts. That ought to tell you. You know where that book is? Mm-hmm, sure. He always keeps it in his desk in his room. Let's go take a look. It's the first room at the right, just back of the stairs. How long has Hayden been with your family, Carl? Mm, I don't know. Seems like as long as I can remember. Make good money? I guess so. I never inquired. What did you and your father quarrel about, son? I'd rather not talk about it. Might help a lot. Mm, here's the room. Where's Hayden now? Well, he went to the mortuary. He's going to the cemetery later. This the desk you spoke about? Mm-hmm, that's the one. It's locked. Well, that's funny. It never has been before that I know of. Nowhere there's a key? No, but... Well, if you want the book, let's break it open. <laughs> After all, it belongs to us. Okay, you pull on the drawer while I pry up on this top. That's it. Oh, here's the book. Let me see it. Hmm. June 10th, one pound package of paper, two dozen envelopes, 25 two cent stamps, 25 ones, one bottle of black fountain pen ink. Oh, there are the stamps, right back of that page. <laughs> funny, didn't put them in the desk in the library. Very funny. Mm hmm. Here are 24 two cent stamps and 25 ones. Shall I answer it? Yeah. No, no, wait a minute, I'll get it. Westcott residence. Hey, Sandy, I'm over at Ritter's apartment. Oh, hello, Devlin. Playing detective again, huh? Yeah, say, listen, the switchboard operator says Ritter did get a call Sunday night. Well, does she, he, or it know where it came from? No, but she says she'd know if it was Carl's voice. She's heard it lots of times. Okay, I'll have him talk to her. She can see if it's the voice who called Ritter. Here, Carl. Huh? Ask for Ritter's apartment and leave a message for him. What for? Never mind, go ahead. Uh, hello? Is Mr. Ritter in? Uh, well, will you tell him to come over to Mr. Westcott's home right away when he comes in? Give me the phone. Well, how about it, Tommy? She says she's sorry, Sandy, but she's positive that that was not the voice that called Ritter Sunday night. Okay, thanks, news hound. Now go on back to work. Young Westcott was taken back to headquarters while Sanderson and Ryan again started out to continue their investigation. Parked in the shadows of low-hanging trees, the officers sat in their car watching the Westcott home. Hi, coppers. Where'd you come from? The stork brought me. Don't you ever sleep. Not when the homicide squad is trying to make a murder out of a suicide. Don't talk so loud. This is a stakeout. Oh, goody. I've always wanted to see one. Quiet. There he comes. We'll let him get underway, then tail him. Uh, who's him? You'll find out, reporter. I'll let her coast to keep the starter from sounding. He's really going places, isn't he? If you ask me, I'd say he was trying to shake you, birds, whoever he is. Yeah, he's just being cagey, in case. Yeah? Well, if you don't get this motor going, your case is going to fold up right in your face. All right, here she goes. 
This is the part I don't like. Catching the criminal, you mean? Now, that is if he is one. My boy, that's the man who murdered old Westcott. You hope. I know. Hold on. You stop him. So are we. Uh, go on by him. We'll walk back. This is far enough. For the love of Pete, this is a cemetery. Yeah, pretty good place for burying things, don't you think? Uh, you hope. I know. Hold on. You stop him. So are we. Uh, go on by him. We'll walk back. This is far enough. For the love of Pete, this is a cemetery. Yeah, pretty good place for burying things, don't you think? Listen, it'd be a good idea if we don't do too much talking. It's pretty quiet around here. Hold it. There goes our man. It looks like he's got a shovel. Want to rush him? Oh, no, let him get started. Let him dig a while. Now, Tommy, you go around to the right. Ryan, you take the left side, and I'll get him from the front here. You admit I'm handy, don't you? Yeah, for the time being. Quiet now and watch him. He's tricky. Get him up, fella. Oh, who are you? What uh, is this? Officer, this is an arrest. Oh, oh no, you don't. Oh, yes, we oh, do, oh, Tommy. I got him. That's what I'm oh, doing. Say, get that butler. He's got in his hand. Give me that bottle. Give it to me. Uh, hey, that stuff's hard on your digestion. You mustn't go around drinking stuff like that. Please give it to me. Please give it to me. Let me drink it. Get your bracelets on him, Ryan. With pleasure. Hey, Sandy, take a look at this. Yeah? Bag full of currency, isn't it, Tommy? Yeah. Say, uh, how did you know? Well, I had an idea Hayden was our man when I found the combination to that safe in his account book this afternoon. So, you broke into my desk. You got that book? Yeah, Hayden, we got it. You weren't satisfied to steal the money. You thought you saw a chance to pin the murder on two innocent persons. You were mighty careless, though, Hayden. You shouldn't have left those other cyanide-coated postage stamps in your account book. You see, the perforations matched the one on the letter Mr. Westcott had just written. Oh, you found that letter? Yeah. Under the paper lining your desk drawer. Our chemist tells us that there's enough cyanide on that stamp to kill half a dozen men. But what really started us off was the way you pasted that single stamp on the blotter of Mr. Westcott's desk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that was clever, wasn't it? <laughs> that way, I was sure he'd get it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he got it all right, Hayden. And that 25th stamp is going to hang you. <laughs> just a moment, Chief Davis will give us additional facts about this case. Speaking of crime, some motor fuels are guilty of treason on the highways because they contribute to the delinquency of your motor. That kind of crime does not pay either. This advertising world is filled with extravagant claims and glowing promises, but you can't fool all the people all the time. As a matter of fact, you can't fool the truly motor-wise any of the time. The officials of 30 leading cities and counties throughout California know what they're doing when, after putting all motor fuels through their paces, they issue orders that only Rio Grande cracked gasoline shall be used to power their emergency equipment. Drop in at the nearest Rio Grande station. Fill up with Rio Grande cracked gasoline, and you will discover the meaning of real police car performance. And now, Chief Davis. The murderer waived all rights to trial and pleaded guilty to the charges brought against him. He received sentences that kept him in prison until his death a few months ago from an ailment of long standing. Cunning though he was, he was not clever enough to make crime a paying proposition. Thank you, Chief Davis. Please calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 238 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case died in prison. That's all. Rolls and quit. Frederick Lindsley bidding you good night for Rio Grande, 